Hello and welcome. My name is Tom Singer. I'm a board member of National Eras and I am hosting this Gaia Then and Now webinar series. This is the second in the series, the second presentation. And I want to take just a few moments to provide some continuity and context for tonight's presentation. The first presentations by Jules Cashford centered around two videos. The first video focused on the origins and characteristics of Gaia, the Greek, ancient Greek goddess of the earth. In the second video, entitled The Return of Gaia, Jules tracked the demise of Gaia over the past two millennia, and now a contemporary emergence of a renewed awareness of Gaia. Two separate and intertwined developments contributed to the desacralization of the earth or the loss of what we might call Gaia consciousness. First, the Judeo-Christian tradition contributed to the increasing split between spirit and nature. Second, the rise of the scientific mind, rise and perhaps dominance of the sun, scientific mind, further contributed to this separation of nature and spirit through the objectification of the material world. This combination of the religious splitting of spirit and nature and the scientific objectification of the material world effectively banished a sense of the sacred as being embodied in the earth. Jules frames her second video according to Owen Barfield's theory that the evolution of human consciousness can be divided into three distinct phases. One, original participation, when the human soul and the soul of the world are experienced as one, which would be how I think the original Gaia was uh, perceived, felt, lived in ancient Greece. The second phase is what Barfield called the withdrawal of original participation from Earth. In that phase, Earth loses her numinosity, she is no longer sacred, and is now in a way set in opposition to humanity. Human, humans become more and more separated from the experience or feeling of an identity or connection to a world soul. And the third stage is what Barfield calls final participation, which he defines as a new kind of participation with Earth. Not in the old original way, because consciousness is inevitably moving on, and there's no way we can really go back to that original, almost unconscious participation, if you will. But this new kind of participation with Earth would be at a new level, which Jules characterizes as coming through the imagination. This involves a dual relationship to the world. It acknowledges our present experience of Earth, as in some way, at least since the last 2000 years, has been separated from us. But it also strives for a new poetic union by ourselves, participating with the natural world, both consciously and, and imaginatively, whatever that comes to mean for each of us. Tonight's presentation can be framed in Barfield's language as the beginning of our exploration of the emergence of this new so-called final participation through the mythopoetic participation, through a mythopoetic vision of contemporary artists. At the end of uh, the presentation tonight, uh, there will be a question and answer period, and I would like to encourage all participants, there is a question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and at any, any time during our presentation, feel free to submit your questions. We probably won't be able to answer all of them, but we'll certainly try and answer some of them. Now I want to introduce the moderator for tonight's event, Bruce Parent. 
Bruce is a Jungian analyst and art therapist. We work together very closely and have for several years in national eras. Bruce received an MFA in painting from the School of Visual Arts in New York and an MA in art therapy from NYU. He previously served as an instructor in NYU's graduate art therapy program, and he is currently on the faculty of New York's JPA, the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association. And as I said, Bruce also serves on the National Board of Eris. Bruce is truly uniquely qualified to moderate tonight's uh, presentation, and I will uh, turn the event over to Bruce at this point. Thank you, Tom, uh, and good evening, everyone. So it's gonna be my pleasure here to begin with to introduce you to our pre pre presentation by Brooke Singer. And I'd like to do that by just reading to you her, her bio and background. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Brooke so that she can do her presentation and then I'll rejoin her and we can have some conversation. Uh, and then we'll be following up with taking your questions um, as well. So it is a, with pleasure that I introduce Brooke Singer to you. She engages in techno science as an artist, an educator, a non-specialist and a collaborator. Her work lives on and offline in the form of websites, workshops, photographs, maps, installations, public art, and performances that often involve participation in pursuit of social change. She is an associate professor of new media at Purchase College, SUNY, New York, and a former fellow at Red Bean Art and Technology Center, and a co-founder of the Art Technology and Activist Group Preemptive Media, and co-founder of La Casita Verde. She's a research affiliate with the Groffman Research Group, an environmental science institute, the Advanced Scientific Research Center at the Graduate Center in CUNY. She has exhibited nationally and internationally at institutions such as MoMA, PS1, the Warhol Museum of Art, uh, the Pompidou, the Nuremberg Museum of Art, Diverse Works, and Matadera in Madrid. She has been in residence at New York Hall of Science, the Marvel House Project, Headlands Center for the Arts, Helsinki International Artist Program, among others. Her writing has been published in Big Data and Society, Radical History Review, and Brooklyn Rail. She's in the collection of the Whitney Museum of American Art, Microsoft and Melba Buxbaum, and Raymond Learcy. So I bring you Brooke. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight, and uh, I really appreciate your generosity and willingness to jump in this with me, Bruce. We just met uh, not so long ago, and uh, this is um, going to be really exciting mixing of minds. Um, I'm really thrilled uh, for all of you who are here tonight, and I really look forward to your questions and that we may engage in conversation after my presentation. I also want to thank Tom, and if you notice that we have the same last name, that's because we are relatives. Tom is my uncle, and uh, we have engaged in conversations, of course, across uh, my whole lifespan and shared um, many interests and have uh, informally shared our work with each other, but this is the first time that we have publicly engaged in um, a discussion, and so that's really uh, very quite special for both of us, I think. Um, I want to thank Eris for this fantastic platform and providing this opportunity, and um, I will go ahead and get started with my presentation now. So you can advance to the next slide. Thank you. Jules Cashford took us on a wonderful and nuanced journey to understand where Gaia, the mother earth goddess originates and its various articulations across locations and time. Gaia's long history, iterations and cosmologies are not familiar to me, but Gaia as a concept or hypothesis is one that regularly occupies contemporary cultural discourse. 
there was a kind of rebirthing of Gaia in the 20th century due to a conversation between two close friends about 50 years ago. Gaia was an offering by novelist William Golding to scientist James Lovelock, who needed a name for his emerging theory of the earth as a living system or how the sum of life optimizes the environment through its own use. This is the origin of the Gaia hypothesis. Since then, Gaia has come to stand for a way of thinking through systems and processes. The name was to bridge areas of knowledge, collapse time space, and welcome people in rather than turn them away. It was a kind of thought experiment or provocation. It brings the mythopoetic in contact with experimental science. But the use of the term and his language in general made Lovelock's emerging concepts prone to ridicule, ridicule and easy to dismiss by scientists as well as though those who generally dislike anthropomorphizing and gendering. In the last session, Jules reminded us that in Paleolithic times, Earth Mother encompassed all genders, and there was not the strict polarization of male and female that we see today. The scientist Lynn Margulis, a close friend and colleague of Lovelock's, who was equally controversial for her independence, wrote that she regretted the personification, was also, but also called Gaia a tough bitch. She described Gaia as symbiosis seen from space. All organisms are touching because all are bathed in the same air and the same flowing water. Gaia does not, does not and has never belonged to one discipline. The contemporary philosopher of science, Isabel Stengers, describes Gaia like this, a fearful and devastating power that intrudes on our categories of thought, that intrudes on thinking itself. Earth Gaia is maker and destroyer, not resource to be exploited or ward to be protected or nursing mother promising nourishment. Gaia is not a person, but complex systemic ph phenomena that compose a living planet. Gaia's intrusion into our affairs is a radically materialist event that collects up multitudes. This intrusion threatens not life on earth itself. Microbes will adapt to put it mildly, but threatens the livability of earth for vast kinds, species, assemblages, and individuals in an event already underway called the sixth great extinction. This event underway is caused by the Anthropocene another ubiquitous concept that was first used around the same time as Golden and Lovelock's conversation and popularized in the early 2000s. The Anthropocene is not an official geological epoch yet, still under consideration to follow the Holocene, but is well established informally across all disciplines as the era when human activity amounts to a geological force. That is the era of today. The two terms Gaia and Anthropocene share many characteristics and are useful to consider together. Both terms asks us to consider the dynamics of our world universe and our place within it. Both terms reference the human, taking human form or positing the human as central. Both are thought experiments, not fully resolved or offering clear answers. Instead, the terms make us do the hard work if we take them up. Both terms are overwhelming, even inco incomprehensible, or what Tim Morton calls hyper objects, beyond human scale of time space, and we can only grasp a part for the whole. And finally, both Anthropocene and Gaia are contested terms. Couldn't we name them better? But as Donna Haraway states, who cares? We work with what we got. She warns us not to let the concept get too big. These stories always threaten to become too big and act like they take over everything. 
In their last session, Tom and Jules discuss what can be what we can do in the face of the divide between nature and spirit or the break with Gaia and what can or should be done in the urgency of our existential crisis. The path humans are on literally ensures the end of human existence and the existence of many other living species in our wake or the sixth great extinction. How do we live and how do we act with such crushing knowledge? Tom apologizes for asking Jules this question of what can be done because it is so concrete, even practical. But this is exactly the work of the artist activists and many, including myself, are taking up this challenge unapologetically. It's not the Saving Mother Earth movement of the 1970s, that is pure hubris, but instead more of finding different ways of relating to each other the non-human and the systems of Gaia in order to evoke a future that can simply include the human. This crisis is of course not evenly distributed, nor are all humans and ways of life equally responsible. The Potawatomi scholar and activist Kyle White writes, quote, the hardships many non-Indigenous people dread most of the climate crisis are the ones that indigenous people have endured already due to different forms of colonialism, ecosystem collapse, species loss, economic crash, drastic relocation, and cultural disintegration. So why art? What use is art? Art has constructed our nature story since the beginning of time. Tim Morton argues in Ecology Without Nature that the idea of nature, which so many hold dear, will have to wither away in the ecological state of human society. Strange as it may sound, the idea of nature is getting the way, in the way of properly ecological forms of culture, philosophy, politics, and art. His book addresses this paradox by considering art above all else. For it is in art that the fantasies we have about nature take shape and dissolve. For me, the category of art, malleable and contingent, is freedom. Allowing the means to pull together, cross wires, prod and provoke. It is not pure fun and folly, although there is plenty of that, but essential thinking through materiality and action. So, can it be through art we can repair this relationship with Gaia, overcome the fissures and divisions, represent nature not as outside and over there, but inside? Bruno Latour raises this issue in his lecture performance Inside, stating Plato's cave is a myth. This strong story of the cave and wanting out blinds us to the fact that we are never outside, he says. This is entanglement. We are part of the processes of Gaia, which we try so hard to represent as a thing to behold and over there. As I dive into these thought experiments and pick up the threads made visible by engaging and brilliant thinkers such as these, I have the nagging worry. But is there time for this? A reasonable question when we're faced with the blaring headlines that there's no time left. Thinking without action causes me anxiety, but maybe doing nothing is exactly what needs to be done. Artist Jenny O'Dell in her talk, How to Do Nothing says, quote, the function of nothing here is that it's a precursor to something. Nothing is neither a luxury nor a waste of time but rather a necessary part of meaningful thought and speech. Look at the immediate reduction of emissions during quarantine. In a study by the Global Carbon Project, scientists found a 17% decrease in carbon dioxide emissions related to the global shelter in place orders tied to the coronavirus pandemic in 2020. A Nature ma Magazine headline in March of 2020 reads, coronavirus lockdowns have changed the way the earth moves. A reduction in seismic noise because of changes in human activity 
is a boon for geoscientists. Stopping large sectors of human activity has been a pandemic of another kind with social and economic dimensions that are not charted here. But this does clearly demonstrate the sudden and major that sudden and major overhauls to the ways we live will absolutely make a profound difference. How can we do that in compassionate, equitable, and life-affirming ways? The architect, systems theorist, inventor, and futurist, Buckminster Fuller, liked to say, quote, if you wanna teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother trying to teach them. Instead, give them a tool the use of which will lead to new ways of thinking. With that said, I'm going to show several contemporary artist projects, starting with two of my own, that use art as a way to think through the troubles of Gaia and the Anthropocene. What can art do and what are these new ways of thinking artists are proposing? The first project I'm going to share with you is Site Profile Flags a series of site-specific flags I made starting in 2018 after the experience of being in a soil pit on a, in a ranch in central California. A soil profile in scientific research is a vertical section of the subsurface used for the study and classification of the layers or horizons that form over time. A deep hole is dug to allow researchers to see the composition below the ground and produce its profile. Each horizon is a distinct layer that has different physical, biological, and chemical properties from adjacent ones. The distinctions are obvious because of texture and color differences. Soil profiles can be appreciated on an aesthetic level. When they're exposed, they can be breathtakingly beautiful. Being inside a soil profile ravine affects people differently. It can be calming, energizing, and sometimes transformative. Some people have attributed this to being six feet underground or at burial depth, and others speak to being immersed in a biochemical field of microbial activity. I've collaborated with scientists on and off for about 20 years now, and for the last five, worked closely with soil scientists. I'm always startled by the strict divisions within the sciences. The division between the arts and sciences is one level of separation, but there are hard boundaries within the natural sciences too. For instance, soil science is a distinct field from plant science and rarely do the two meet. To study the biochemical exchange between plant and soil becomes an interdisciplinary affair. My urge in the pit was to knit that below ground and above together or turn the earth inside out through a visual representation to expand where the edges are usually defined. To do this, I sought ways to transfer those physical, biological, and chemical properties of the layers I was seeing, human, plant, rock, soil, microbes, et cetera, onto fabric by making dye from clay, topsoil, rock, charcoal, plant, lichen, trees, metals, and so forth found on the site. Sometimes making the dyes was fairly straightforward and other times it verged on the ridiculous, like when I made a dye from marble. Lastly, I sewed the dyed fabrics together to create a flag to mark the site and represent the ecosystem parts that are often symbiotic and always enmeshed. The flag in the end is a bioregional representation as opposed to a geopolitical one. The flag in New Paltz, New York, this flag in New Paltz, New York, is installed on a dead cedar found at the site, which is Unison Art Center. The dying cedars are a large part of the visible story of the transformation of this place currently. Over time, the flag and tree will decay and return back to the ground where I removed them. Second project of mine I wanna share with you tonight is called Carbon Sponge, which I also started in 2018 and is ongoing. 
This is a different kind of work in that it's large scale collaboration with soil scientists, city agencies, cultural centers, urban land stewards, farmers, among others. It started in 2018 when I was granted the opportunity to be a designer in residence at the New York Hall of Science in Corona Park, Queens. I was learning a lot about soil carbon sequestration at the time, or the ability of agricultural land to be cultivated in such a way as to sink carbon, returning it back to the ground from where we extracted it. This is a form of biomimicry or nature-based solution to a man-made problem. This graphic promotes the French program four per a thousand, which states if we can increase the carbon content in rural soils by just 0.4% per year, we can halt the annual increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. My initial questions were, can urban soils like rural soils be effective in carbon sequestration and a means to mitigate anthropomorphic, anthropogenic climate change? And can anyone, not only scientists, accurately track the increase or decrease of carbon in soil over time? So in the backyard of the Science Museum, I set up an experiment with science, scientists from CUNY Graduate Center's Advanced Scientific Research Center. We built 24 raised beds for the experiment, which was both a garden and a museum exhibit. The beds were filled with a mix of sediment from a construction site that, that was removed from 50 feet below ground. This sediment was formed 20,000 years ago when a glacier covered much of New York City. The sediment, which looks a lot like sand, has zero biology or carbon until we mixed it with New York City made compost that was created about two to three years ago. The soil we human engineered, making it distinctly urban, was consistent across all these beds. And we changed the planting combination to compare changes in carbon content across time. We have collected and tested soil samples over several years and assembled a generalist kit used by a group of urban farmers in New York City and now rural farmers that we're reviewing in relation to lab data. We have run tours, workshops, and museum floor demonstrations. We have written a user's guide and a scientific white paper. The research questions and answers are a large part of Carbon Sponge. Other important concerns include the blending of disciplines or expanding what art and science are supposed to do. Finally, I am also interested in the stories that unfold. I've experienced a vast sense of wonder and astonishment during the process that I try my best to relate. For instance, the story of rhizobia. These are bacteria that cluster in the billions forming little sacs about the size of peas attached to the roots of certain plants. When they glow a beautiful shade of pink, they are actively transforming atmospheric nitrogen into a plant usable form in exchange for the plant's sugar. This is a vital symbiotic relationship upon which a whole range of life depends. Plants can't survive without this form of nitrogen provided by the rhizobia and bacteria exist on the food from the plant. Humans need nitrogen too, so we, we eat plants or we eat animals that once ate plants since we are similar to plants in that we cannot uptake atmospheric nitrogen directly. Our lives depend on these minuscule bacteria, the rhizobia, who you may be meeting for the first time today. Here are the complex systemic phenomena composing a living planet. This movement of energy and substance between the living and the non-living from the atmosphere through the plants into the ground sucked up by microbes eating and decaying to release back into soil, plants, human, and the air is of course the maker and destroyer Gaia. We have come to expect art to inspire us, even leave us awestruck and in more recent times, challenge our ways of thinking. The German artist, Joseph Beuys, famously said, everyone is an artist, 
and create a practice called social sculpture to infuse this orientation across everyday life. I recently listened to the science fiction writer, Ted Chang, in conversation with Ezra Klein, who describes his sensibility in a historical context. Many Renaissance scientists were profoundly religious and they saw no conflict in that at all. And for them, understanding how the universe worked was getting to know God better by understanding his creation more clearly and feel like that wonder that comes with understanding how the universe works is very closely related to religious awe. I think that when scientists discover something new about the universe, I imagine that what they feel is almost identical to what deeply religious people feel when they feel like they're in the presence of God. I wish that we could get back a little of that attitude instead of thinking of religion and science as being fundamentally diametrically opposed. So maybe the question is, how do we recuperate and sustain our sense of awe in daily life and in the work that we do? And now I want to end with sharing a few examples of other artists' works in this arena. Honestly, the task of selecting a few to include in this presentation was extremely difficult because there are so many artists working with these ideas and in so many different and fascinating ways. This is what you call a good problem. I start with Claire Pentecost proposal for a new American agriculture because, well, it's a flag. The work is both iconic and visceral. Pentecost composted an American flag in a worm bin for several months, transforming most of it into living soil. There is a backstory here, pun intended. In gardening circles, there's a trick to bury cotton underwear in the ground and leave it for several months before pulling it out. This is a cheap and easy soil test. The more disintegrated the underwear, the higher the level of soil microbes, an indicator of soil health. The cotton undies are food for the microbes. For me, this work speaks to where our national priorities should rest. Our soil is a national treasure that is most often kicked around like dirt. It also speaks to the power of the invisible or forgotten. It makes manifest the smallest but mightiest of organisms. And the decomposed flag, of course, represents our failing state that barrels towards oblivion and end of times with unequaled rates of consumption and lack of political will to correct course to ensure a future. This next work is also a collaboration with microbes. This is titled Thinking Like a Cloud by Polish artist Karolina Sobeka, currently based in Berlin. In this project, Sobeka builds a cloud collector to sample cloud moisture and its microbial content. The sample is then analyzed and ingested by human participants. New discoveries about human microbiome is changing the way we think about biology and the way we think about what it means to be human. Not only do more than half the cells in our body belong to microorganisms, making us only 43% human, but the human microbiome affects our health, mood, and response to certain medications. An article in the Journal of Psychiatric Research reads, quote, collective unconscious, how gut microbes shape human behavior. Furthermore, scientists are learning more about the microbiome of clouds and how bacteria help to create weather, including lightning. This research is present or influences Sobeka's artwork. This project is called Thinking Like a Cloud. So what we're doing is collecting 
cloud um, and analyzing this cloud water for different microorganisms that constitute its microbiome. If our objective is thinking like a cloud and our method is cloud ingestion, uh, um, we're becoming part cloud through ingesting the cloud microbiome that then mixes with our own microbiome. And we already know that sort of the interactions of the microbes with the host organism have effect and play a role in who we are as people, kind of our personality, our behavior. If some of that microbiome is of cloud origin, that then lets us have a wider uh, perspective on the world and the climate. So you can see from here the net yeah. is getting saturated. Yeah, I saw that already. It's going to take a while for it to start. Start dripping yeah. down. It's really hard to uh, sample uh, microbes from the clouds really high because planes don't fly that high. That's why we normally send this into the atmosphere on a balloon that goes up, up over 60,000 feet. Um, and we have some interesting samples from whatever life can be up there and can survive up there. Next, I'll share with you a recent installation by Korean artist Annika Yi called In Love with the World that was commissioned for the Tate Modern in 2021. Floating in the air, her machines, called Arabs, are based on ocean life forms and mushrooms. They reimagine artificial intelligence and encourage us to think about new ways machines might inhabit the world. Yi has also created unique scentscapes which change weekly with odors linked to a specific time in the history of the site. <laughs> Where do you get your ideas from? That's an almost unanswerable question, but I'll try. I'm sort of just actively uh, tapped into the world around me and I'm thinking about some of the, the bigger questions surrounding our existence today and thinking about uh you know our role and our uh sort of symbiotic relationship to other living and non-living forms what particular areas of science have informed the piece i have been very much influenced by uh, microbiology synthetic biology um and a lot of ai research i was wondering how the history of, uh, of Bankside and uh, this building has uh, fed into the work. What I wanted to do is to create an aquarium of machines and to imagine a natural history of machines. Uh, I wanted to tie in our moment today with uh, a broader historical moment of the Turbide Hall site. So the history of Bankside was a huge uh, sort of inspirational starting point for the project. I was thinking about the origins of the, uh, you know, the sort of industrial revolution, which really the epicenter was London and, and, and the original use of Turbine Hall um, as this, you know, energy conversion uh, site. What made you decide to include <laughs> smells in the exhibition? So the smells, were, uh, they function in a really critical way in that they underscore the, the larger theme around air uh, as this substrate that, that, that ties everything, everyone into the project. The, uh, the odors do refer to these uh, different historical periods. There are more interpretations of these periods that are important in the sort of evolution of where we are today uh, in the bank side. So we have pre-historical sense, uh, you know, Jurassic, Cretaceous. We also have Roman and Black Death and Tudor and Machine Age um, odors. And this is a way to also allow for the Arabs to, to learn about life on Earth through these historical soundscapes. This next work I wanna share with you is a collaborative art project that builds and distributes renewable energy sources around the globe and ties them together using a unique form of artificial intelligence by the artist Tiga Brain 
Alex Nathanson, Benedetta Pinantella. The work is called Solar Protocol and it asks, what would technologies based on natural or environmental intelligence look like? How might we design with natural intelligence as opposed to artificial? What if digital networks operated according to their environmental conditions? How would our relationship to the internet change if it were dependent on the sun? How do energy systems shape our culture? Earthly dynamics like day length, season, weather, and even the fluxes created by the activities and cultures of other life forms, these are all things that profoundly shape our lives. These shifting environmental conditions and influences could be understood as a kind of logic or even a kind of natural intelligence. One definition of intelligence is the capacity to synthesize knowledge as logic and apply that logic to make decisions. At a time when we are outsourcing decision-making to our technological systems, a key question then becomes, what logics are we choosing to automate? And what are the underlying values that they enact? The use of data-driven methods such as artificial intelligence for automation has become widespread. But what would technologies based on a kind of natural or environmental intelligence look like? How might we learn to design with natural intelligence? Solar Protocol is a project that attempts just this. It is a web platform hosted across a network of solar powered servers located around the world. Each server, a server being a small solar powered computer, becomes active or inactive as the sun rises and sets in its location. Internet traffic to our web platform is then directed to whichever server has the most sunshine at the time. So we're using the intermittency and cyclical nature of solar energy distributions across the planet as a form of natural logic. And we use this logic to program how this network operates, as well as what visitors to our site might see at different times of day or at different times of the year. So we're exploring how the qualities of solar energy provide an opportunity to change our relationship to the technologies they power. And finally, I'm going to end with one last project. Uh, these are images of work by the Greek artist duo Hyperkampf. It seems fitting to end in contemporary Greece. Hyperkampf is researching the landscape of the seabed specifically marine cave ecologies as a stage of the Anthropocene and culture's undoing. They have teamed up with a marine biologist from the island of Crete to study the impact of plastics on a marine cave ecosystem in this work titled Marine Cave Benthic Terrazzo. The terrazzo tiles they make inlaid with the recovered plastics from the cave when are, they are installed, invite the subject of the ocean inside our terrestrial homes. The tiles combine function and beauty and are a form of communication for this ongoing research. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Brooke. That is such a collection of provocative and fascinating work. Uh, it's not easy to enter in to that uh, in, in a, any small way. And I wanna go back and sort of pick up a question or two that you're actually asking yourself um, here. And so the first one is really the difference between natural and artificial intelligence. Um, I actually think that's a great way to sort of get into this issue about, you know, what do, what do those terms mean to you as we sort of try to understand this notion of Gaia? Well, I guess I'll start with what those terms mean for solar protocol in the last piece. I mean, that's, that's where this distinction between natural and artificial intelligence comes from. And, um, you know, for, for those three artists, uh, they're really interested in looking at um, uh, 
taking the sun and the energy from the sun as the driver for the logic of the, this intelligence system, um, rather than a uh, human-made protocol, which is a programming language and decision-making by an individual or corporation. Um, and that is often very transparent or not very transparent. Um, so we see the systems working, but we don't really understand. Um, sometimes it's it's made for us not to, you know, very hard for us to understand why these certain choices are being made. Um, so what I really love about that last project is there's this um, uh, pointing to and opening up of um, where uh, the uh, web page basically is being served from. I mean, if you go to that web page, it will say, you know, this is being uh, served up to you uh, by this server in Australia and this location at this time of day with this much power and, um, you know, this, this many hours of sunlight. Uh, and so there's this, uh, I mean, similar maybe to what I was talking about being in the soil pit is like this kind of um, folding, turning something inside out um, to make it, make it clear um, and to welcome people in. Um, and then this other idea of like kind of what's natural and what's artificial um, does kind of push against some of these concepts um, of uh, that I was presenting earlier about the inside versus the outside, right? Um, and this idea that Gaia is not out there, that's within all of these processes, um, and we're immersed in it uh, in such a way that it's, you know, the air we breathe and the waters we swim. And so, um, you know, it's, it's again, it, it doesn't really come to mind or we don't really um, uh, think about environment until we name it. Um, and that's kind of a very distinct quality of it. And once you name it and discuss it, there's that kind of separation too and that objectification that Tom started the conversation with. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a lot of what's going on here is how we as humans, um, you know, we uh, Tom talked about the divide between spirit and nature. And in art practice, we often talk about the divide between culture and nature and how um, actually, you know, that again is, is something that we as humans are forced to do because it's how we organize our thoughts or speak about something. Um, but that kind of separation is also dangerous in terms of then the separate, separate from the subject and the object and this idea of extraction or um, uh, being, you know, above or being able to man manipulate things, which has um, gotten us into the pro this problem of the Anthropocene. Yeah, it's a, immersion, I think, is a beautiful word for describing that because what struck me about that project right, is that it invites people into an imaginative piece of work to sort of locate the sun and that piece draws them not out of the technology and into a larger narrative through the process of imagination. And mm. so that you immerse, they get to immerse people in that deeper sense of their place in the world and as part of that system. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, it's it is a lot of this like highlighting that goes on. We don't think about like where our data comes from and the cables, and we call it the cloud when it's not cloud; it's hardware, and it's um, there's uh, a whole infrastructure that is built in tangible and material. And through this project that they've created, um, you're, you're hyper aware of that, right? Because you're understanding where the information is coming from and why it's coming from this place has to do about the location of the sun. And we don't think about the sun in relationship to our laptop. The only time we do might be to be like, oh, it's, you know, I'm outside and it's creating a glare on my screen. God darn it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that kind of... Uh, reorienting our, our perspective and bringing, you know, into focus um, these uh, natural systems is, uh, through, through computational technology is really lovely. Yeah, I think that one of the things that's striking here to me is that in thinking about the Gaia hypothesis, right, one of the things that Lovelock is talking about is that it is the system 
that it, it's not just the planet and and the people right it is the whole system that he's getting at so the way in which your work your per, your particular work as well as the works that you've chosen here highlight that question about the anthropocene and this question about what do humans within that system do to help change that system because it's not an accident that a human is in that system right and so part of what i'm what's in, totally intriguing to me is that what you're doing is provoking consciousness mm. right yeah and that that is one way to say it, or, or um, maybe the way I usually speak about it is that we're um, telling new stories, right? And this is like a new cosmology of um, our relationship to each other and our relationship to things, our relationship to other um, uh, non-human beings, and how um, that all, uh, um, the stories are there, but they, you know, how can we amplify those stories or where do we find those stories and why are they being, you know, why are they not told? Like the story of the rhizobia, why did it take me this long to know about this, um, you know, uh, life supporting teeny uh, bacteria in the soil, right? So um, I, I think it's about highlighting these different stories and um, learning how, uh, or, or using them to um, kind of reorient ourselves. Is part of that this question about nature as a story that sort of got in the way or gets in the way? And it's, is that something that you think about directly in terms of trying to challenge or expand that notion of nature? Yeah, I think, I think I'm just curious about those stories and where they came from. And Tim Morton, the, the quote that I, I read earlier, um, you know, talks about nature getting in the way and uh, instead thinking about ecology, which is really about, you know, moving away from the separation and this maybe putting nature on a pedestal, having it be out there, having it be something we go to, we visit, we put a fence around um, to being uh, the system that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, I think it's, uh, there's a movement maybe of, of um, interrogating the word nature and maybe favoring this idea of ecology, which does stress um, systems and it's more of this immersive inside position. Yeah, it's striking to me how your piece, the flag piece I'm thinking about in particular, uh, that it, it not only draws you into that pit and all that that means, but it's, if we think about what Tom and Jules was talking about, about this sort of separation where sort of the mind separates, spirit separates out of nature, there's so much of what you're doing is turning that backwards. And so both the, the immersion, the journey into that pit, and then to lift that up is both an act of trying to bring that to the surface and rising so that what's above is so below, but there's also an aesthetic quality to that that I think is remarkable. Because when I look at that flag, I'm thinking of sort of all of the emotional resonances that that color carries with it. Mm, yeah. And that you know that the artist. Yeah. And the thing that you don't get, and actually not many people do, even when it's installed, is the smell of that flag is so fabulous. And I still have scraps here in my apartment. I sometimes just bury my face into it because it's just like... Um, the same, there's a certain bacteria in soil that gives it that earthy smell and it's just um, kind of like life-giving and addictive. And I, there has been some studies that it is an antidepressant, whether, I don't know if that's um, totally proven or not, but, uh, you know, I, um, there's, there's just like so much um, in that work that, uh, um, that's in the process. So um, uh, to make that flag in New Paltz, it was 2020 and I wanted to make it through a workshop and bring people, um, invite people in to identify like, what are these ecosystem parts and what should be represented in this bioregional flag? And that wasn't possible in the pandemic, but I did invite uh, a couple of artists in and we walked, um, you know, one by one, I would invite someone in 
And I started with a few artists who I knew and, and, and had an attachment to the, to that space. And we would just walk the landscape and talk about it, um, their experience with it, what they were seeing, what interests them, um, uh, how they installed their work at the site. Um, one woman uh, is, was, is a natural dyer. And so she was identifying uh, different plants for me. And another artist um, works a lot with wood and knew the story about the cedar tree um, and why the cedars were dying. And he linked it um, uh, to the, the flooding, uh, some, some rising waters um, uh, and some flooding. And, and then he actually told me to um, contact this geographer who lived nearby who came and we walked the land and then a geologist came in and then a wilderness expert. And it became this amazing um, unfolding uh, kind of, you know, multifaceted uh, description of place that kind of we walk the same path over and over again, but I was walking with different people with different experience and different expertise. Um, and that that what that that fed into into that flag piece, and actually I I I, I turned it into a book um, because while I was walking and having these conversations, I realized that that was as much of the piece as the flag itself. Um, so for me, the process um, I was learning how to read a landscape. How is the landscape an archive? Um, and then I would kind of it was a little bit of a game of telephone. So when I was with one person I would, you know, digest their stories and retell them to the next person who'd tell me their own stories and it kind of relayed from person to person. Um, so for, for me, you know, that that is as much of the piece as that flag that's flying on the pole. That, make, that makes sense. I mean, that's, it's your reference to voice, right? Yeah. Is, yeah. That the, the experience of doing that and the immersion that you're doing and that how it's an event, but you're, you're, insinuating your intelligence and your play and your body and your experience along with others into those events. And that's transformative. Yeah. So it makes a whole new relationship. I'm thinking of the cloud piece and in, in, in along the same lines, the way in which their provocation is a similar sort of thing about trying to have this new relationship. We actually have a question too as well on the cloud piece here. Um, so this is from, Kathy, who asks, in Greek myth, Zeus formed Nephili, a cloud in the form of Hera, to deceive Axion, who was trying to seduce Hera. I was interested in the research on the cloud's effect on humans. Could the Greeks have anticipated this interaction in the myth? That's amazing. Um, you can go onto Carolina's website and she actually asked the participants to uh, keep a journal after drinking the cloud water and bacteria. Um, and there's some videos too of, of the participants talking about the effect. Um, I, uh, I have not participated in this piece. Um, I adore it. Uh, I really love this notion of um, merging our microbiome with that of the cloud. And then there's this like, uh, kind of um, suggestion that then we are have the perspective of the cloud, right? We think like the cloud, um, we are kind of more maybe attuned to climate in a way um, that we weren't before. And it has this kind of like literal sense of merging of the microbiome and this kind of potion magical imaginary. Um, and that intertwining I think is really playful and, and fantastic. That's great. Also, supposedly Lovelock, um, in his like range of theories and ideas, um, did talk about the microbiome of clouds, and uh, that was you know um, some 30, 40 years before um, these uh, more recent scientific studies that are proving that um, microbiome that, that there are microbiome in clouds and that they have this function too. So I, I think that's uh, really interesting. It's a great image. If you just think about how that story, either in yours or in their work, right, where the individual becomes sort of a fractal version of that Gaia system. Mm. Right. 
all of that complexity and that whole system starts to get changed. So the question about how that happens at the at the individual level, which is one of the things that Lovelock was talking about, is that it's not necessarily at some fractured point within the individual that those individuals are systems. Mm. Just like Gaia, there is one large system that's working. Right. Um, right. So, and you're, the way you play with that, and to me, I just want to highlight again: there's so much about what you're doing that's so much about intuitive and caring, mm. and personal and values. Even though you're bringing an intelligence to the task that is more scientific and learning and interesting and, and, and focused on th that way, there's also another kind of learning that's going on there as well um, that gets valued. Yeah, I value both. And I value when they butt up against each other and merge. Um, yeah, and I, I just... in. Uh, Recent past, I was writing a proposal for um, the college where I teach about doing an interdisciplinary art science program. And I used the word intuition. Um, and a science professor read that proposal and said he loved it, except he had to strike out the word intuition. <laughs> he intuitively had to strike out the word intuition. And we had a long conversation and the word was left in, but um, that, was, that was funny to me. You reserve the right to intuitively disagree with you. Right. Yes. So we have another question here too. This one's from JC, who says, you mentioned that there are many artists are concerned with anthrop anthropogenic climate change. Is there a clearinghouse or database that shares the various projects and artists who are working on this movement? Or how did you discover the artists you've introduced us to this evening? Great question. Um, there are some clearing houses. Uh, each one has its own kind of angle. Um, there is uh, an organization called Ars Electronica, which is based in Linz, Austria. And they have a exhibition and award ceremony every year. Um, and there's a lot of this work um, that is actually solar protocol, I just noticed uh, was, um, was included in, in last year's exhibition and, and maybe won a prize, I can't remember. Um, but Ars Electronica is a great place to go to. Um, it's science, it's environment, it's technology, so it's pretty broad. Um, there are other uh, sites that are more um, eco art, environmental art focused, and I can make that part of, I will be providing a bibliography with refer a list of the books and references. Um, included in my presentation, and we can uh, include some of those with that as well. Right. In terms of how I found these artists, um, you know, it's, uh, these are my colleagues. I know three out of four of those artists that I've showed personally and have worked with some of them in the past. Um, the one artist I do not know and have never seen her work is Annika Yi, who has gotten a lot of press for that arrow piece that was just installed at, um, uh, at the uh, Tate Modern. Um, she is based in New York City where I live, so I'm hoping I will meet her at some point. Um, but I've been in this field now for quite a long time and, and teach it. So um, I, I, you know, I, I have um, uh, years of exposure and reading and references. Um, but those three or four that I chose was somewhat random. And that's why I kind of apologize before presenting it because how do you select out of this just mass amount of um, amazing work? Uh, but I decided to focus on the microbe for the most part, because that's um, where uh, really kind of uh, my two works that I included um, uh, the focus there. And it just made sense to extend off of that as kind of a thematic for tonight. So uh, David asked a question about, have you explored Margulis's concept of the Hall of Oint in your work? Uh, not directly. Um, I'm really interested in Lynn Margulis. Um, I uh, think the endosymbiosis theory um, is fascinating and did not come across that until, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when I was when I was doing uh, Carbon Sponge. Um, this idea that uh, evolution is driven by symbiosis and um, 
cells, uh, distinct cells merging uh, to create organelles like the mitochondria or um, the chloroplast. Um, that uh, her her theories like Lovelock were considered outlandish. Um, Lynn Margulis did not. Uh, she did not originate the idea of endosymbiosis. I think someone, in, a Russian scientist did, but she picked it up and advanced it um, and was really derided for it um, until uh, the end of life and posthumously. Um, now it's, it's uh, generally accepted by uh, biologists. Um, but this idea that the driver of life is this kind of um, joining together and a symbi symbiotic relationship um, not this, uh, you know, uh, idea of uh, survival of the fittest um, and the competition. So, so you know, I that 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 part of Lynn Margolis has been um, really riveting. And I guess one other thing about Lynn Margolis and and James Lovelock, um, Scott Gilbert is another scientist that I read. Uh, these are scientists who are doing amazing research and discoveries but are writing in such a way that they're welcoming people in and they have um, language that is approachable and they connect their scientific discoveries to things outside of the laboratory. Um, and I find that so inspiring and so important. Um, and again, that uh, it's becoming much more accepted, but in the 1970s when uh, James Lovelock was, was writing, uh, a lot less so. So that's another reason I really appreciate Lynn Margolis. Yeah. There's a question here that comes up around back on your project, uh, which is that uh, this is a uh, thankful Butler asked, did you talk with any of the Native Americans whose ancestors lived in the area? And if so, did their stories of the land or of their mythology have any influence on your work? Not for the New Pulse work, um, and I wish I did or um, could have. Um, uh, I, I have been um, working um, Carbon Sponge, the other project. I have uh, had more kind of conversations um, with Indigenous um, uh, kind of um, practices and farmers um, and thinking about, uh, and I didn't really address this in the talk tonight, but um, the, the language around carbon sequestration and regenerative ag is very, um, a lot of times it seems like a new approach or uh, something that um, has not been done before when in fact um, it is really pulling from traditional um, uh, ecological knowledge and uh, that that without that there should always be um, kind of consideration or um, at least acknowledgement of that when uh, doing regenerative agriculture um, because this idea of like diversity and no till and moving from space to space that is what Native Americans were practicing um, prior to uh, you know um, uh, the explorers coming to America. So um, that's where kind of that conversation has been more prevalent for me. That's one of those, you know, parts that we inherit being here, right, is that with the people of the land here, depending on how one hears the stories that come to us, right, that it's anywhere from 12,000 to 50,000 years that people were here that there were either a million or five million people inhabiting these lands and that they had been there for thousands and thousands of years and that the Europeans upon arrival by their own records are saying we've arrived in a place that looks like paradise and have managed in the space of 500 years to completely mess yeah. that up. Yeah. So there's such a fundamentally different and I know you know this right because there's such a fundamentally different relationship to to earth, to the land, to the sense of ownership, to sense of stewardship, and sort of the mythology of the various different indigenous peoples that was shared something about a relationship to land that was just so fundamentally different from that which organized the Europeans. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so um, that, that needs to be recuperated. That needs to be, I mean, these movements to um, uh, um, allow native tribes to uh, care for redwood forests and, um, you know, repatriate land, um, that, that would probably go a long way towards um, kind of this care and repair that we're talking about. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's um, uh, a really important, interesting point. I think it, your contribution here to me is, you know, so interesting because to, I think it's Barfield's point, that you can't just sort of relearn what had been learned. You can't go back and, uh, and be in the same place because that place is gone. Um, right. And, right, and so there's a whole question here about how do you sort of regain the spirit of something? How do you transform consciousness? If, the more that I listen to you, the more I'm reminded of Teilhard de Chardin's newest fear. And do you, are you familiar with that, his notion? Uh, the term, yeah, I, I know the term. So it's this idea about that, you know, if you look so much of what we're talking about has to do with that, you know, great photo of Earth from 69. Right. And how that was such a provocation for so many people to finally sort of see, not only does it sort of give them photographic proof that the world is round, it gives that image of that globe in space. Mm -hmm. So this idea of the unity of that and Lovelock's notion, there's got to be a unified system here and all of his work to sort of say that this doesn't happen in the abstract. His, so his theory has a lot to do with that the biology created this planet, not just that it's a happenstance that you have a neutral planet that allowed life to be sustained. Right. So it's that dynamic. Right. So with that notion, right, is that partly what you're doing is like by, by moving yourselves materially and experientially into these activities, you are creating new forms of consciousness. Mm. Right? And that opening your minds, you're being playful about that. Um, I think it's enormously important. Uh, and that one of the things that you're talking about is like, well, how do you get back to that sense of awe? Um, to me, listening to you, part of it comes with the humility of not being a scientist, of not knowing, mm -hmm. and of the willingness to learn. Yeah. Yeah. I think the not knowing is really, uh, that's something I think about a lot um, and how uh, not knowing can often cause fear or, um, uh, you know, building structures to like cover up that not knowing um, instead of diving into it and being opening to like learning and maybe not being right. Um, and uh, there's just so much, uh, kind of pontificating and having to have a strong opinion about something and repeating it a lot and um, it being, you know, through the echo chamber uh, that, you know, this kind of a way to react to that is um, to, to ask more questions, I guess, or uh, you know, never not be definitive or um, it's okay. Like this idea of being humble is considered um, not a great characteristic, right? That we always need to be like confident and strong in our opinion. So there are all of, all of these myths um, or ways of living that I think um, are outdated. And so it's, it's, a, it's about uh, not only like the materiality and the kind of exploring of that with our bodies and, our, and uh, through these projects, um, but it's, it's also that, uh, really important interrelationship between people and bringing people in and going into other people's work, doing what we're doing here today, uh, you know, bringing together, uh, different ways of thinking that overlap and stretching, you know, stretching it in different directions, seeing where they meet, uh, understanding where they don't and why and piecing through it. So it's, it's, it's that hard work that I talked about in the presentation that, takes time and um, doesn't feel like taking action uh, in terms of like the climate clock ticking, but is probably potentially the most important actions we can be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Does it help you to think, do you read a myth? Does it help you to be thinking about myths, talk about myths, sort of see 
sort of the hermeneutics of the, the work through a lens of myth? Um, no, I'm not a myth reader. <laughs> Maybe I'll become so after this series is over. Um, no, it's, it's not my area. It's not, uh, Tom has pulled me into this um, as, you know, because there's a lot of overlap and a lot of interest. Um, I read a lot of these, you know, um, uh, what, what are science and technology studies, these cultural critics, the Donna Haraways and the Tim Morton and the um, people, uh, Bruno Latour, who I've, uh, I mentioned here, um, are, that's kind of a lot of food for my art practice and also is part of my teaching. Um, I also am starting to read more science fiction, which I think is really generative and amazing, um, or cli-fi, they're calling it climate fiction. Um, and I'm a big news consumer, but no, I'm not, I'm not a myth reader. Well, you'll appreciate that someone here, Robert here is recognizing that he sees your four projects as representing earth, air, fire, and water. Oh, that is very interesting. Completely unintentional, but I can see how that works. <laughs> Unconsciously. Well, that's the beauty of this, right? Is that right. as you follow your desires and your, you know, your intuitions, you know, they lead you into something here that that some of us can look at, just like if you're looking at, you know, others' artworks, there's a number of different ways to sort of see them and do the critique of them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, part of when we work as Jungians with images, one of the things we're thinking about oftentimes is the amplification. And the idea about how many times have we seen this image or this motif? How many times does this recur? And mm. how does this recur? So, for instance, your flag, right? And the pole. The pole alone is a totally mythic image. Mm. All about this, you know, at the navel of the world to connect into heaven. So there's a deep resonance right there about how your work about creating and linking what was below to what's above Mm -hmm. part of the way you talk about it and it's right there in the image of the pole mm -hmm. just like all of those you know the images of the flags i was saying if you think about uh your work and how color is so much a part of conveying meaning to them um, yeah. Yeah. and so i would guess that each one of these if we were to sort of sit around a fire and talk we'd get a chance to sort of drop down and start to listen to sort of the mythic narrative that's mm -hmm. also going on at the same time Right? Because if part of what you're doing is trying to increase the dimensionality of understanding, of resonance, of inhabitation, right? that the more that that happens, the less likely we are to soil our own nest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's a very different way of bringing in and, um, and uh, kind of... Uh, Kind of attaching ourselves to to the work i mean the, the work i do is is not you know it's often participatory um the flag uh less so which is why i think i really wanted to be made in a workshop format um carbon sponge is completely like that and maybe more indicative of my past work um where for me bringing people in and like spreading these ideas and um, learning together is about involving people in the process and like then there's the kit that people can take and use you know um, wherever they see you know fitting or the user guide is another tactic um, kind of within my community of artists of like you know the how to DIY here's here are the tools that we've built or are learning um, pass them on, retool them yourselves uh, and uh, do what you want kind of thing. Um, so it's it's kind of takes more from an activist and um, uh, participatory um, kind of history, I guess. So do you have thoughts in there? So this is pushed a little harder into that direction. So in addition to myth, there's a question of sort of the psychological development of the artists as individuals. Right. Mm -hmm. So we don't have this concept in terms of individuation. And uh, Terry is mentioning it here is that his view that 
it's an opus contra natura, right? It's an act against nature. So how would you understand that from your point of view? What's an act against nature? I, I, I missed that. Individuation. So Jung's idea that an individual has some, a way in which they're going to become a unique being. And in order to become that being, there has to be a move against nature. Um, so it's, it sets up this question about just what you were saying before about, well, what does nature mean? Mm. And so, you know, it for you in here, right, it raises the questions about, well, how do you see your work as an artist? How do you see your fellow artists work, you know, lining up with their own sense of becoming them, themselves as individuals and mm. as well as making this sort of social and um, artistic contribution? Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are things I never think about. <laughs> <laughs> Quite honestly. <laughs> and I need to spend some time uh, because it's, for me, my work is not about me as the individual and I'm, it's not about expression. Um, it really, it's from a different history and different place. Um, and I derive a lot of satisfaction from it, um, but it's not, uh, ever coming from a place of personal expression. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can hear how much of it's focused on the creative act. And there's something in that process of that creativity and sort of the, the commitment to something in here about transformation uh, mm -hmm. that runs a, as a theme through your work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, the transformation is like the under, I'm a city girl. Uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, the past 25 years have lived in New York City. Uh, so for me, um, I, uh, there's this um, kind of need to like, uh, you know, be in soil and, be out of the kind of rush of the city and the concrete of the city. Although I love being immersed in that too. Um, and it's, uh, um, you know, my, my practice, I, I kind of stumbled into uh, eco art um, through a project when I was uh, part of preemptive media, this collective. Um, we actually built air monitoring devices in 2006. Um, and this was post 9-11, and we were asked to do a commission in Lower Manhattan that responded to um, the tragedy of the Twin Towers falling. We didn't feel, uh, we didn't know what to do, and talking about air quality and the way, um, you know, the air was safe to breathe was a statement that was made, you know, immediately after 9-11 in a very, um, uh, fake and, um, you know, is deceitful. Um, so that project, um, which was building with uh, my collaborator, who, who was an electrical engineer, and then my other collaborator, who was a sculptor, um, building these air monitoring devices and passing them around and learning just like basic vocabulary about common air pollutants became that project air by preemptive media. Um, and then from that project, I met this scientific advisor at the EPA um, who I was trying to interview about some sort of technology or protocol or something. And he was like, I don't know anything about that. But let me tell you that all of Lower Manhattan should have been declared a super fun site post 9-11. And I knew the like gravity of that statement, but I didn't really understand what a super fun site was. And so the next literally seven years, I was investigating Superfund, photographing Superfund sites across the country, um, building data visualizations of EPA data that was not accessible or visually engaging for people. Um, so I guess this is kind of a long way of saying that um, uh, I kind of fell into this line of work and got hooked and one thing led to another. Um, and now working with the soil um, that, uh, that I like did not like foresee for myself. Um, I think also a lot of artists right now are doing this because this is really, you know, the most urgent and pressing um, uh, 
kind of matter of our time, um, you know, that intersects with a lot of other very pressing matters of our time. Um, so it's, it's, it's been actually um, kind of wonderful to see that movement snowballing and becoming um, really large and, um, and, and with lots of par participation by artists. So that's a perfect segue to this next question from Ron, who's saying he's very excited and stimulated by your project of closing an artificial gap established by predominant cultural systems between art and science, earth and spirit, soul and technology, culture and nature, ultimately subject and object. May we not extend this deconstructive approach by deliteralizing the concept of art and artist by seeing all consciousness as in its own way, aesthetic form emergent from the convergence of several systems in the moment. Blake, for example, imagined every moment of human consciousness as an art object. In the Museum of the Phenomena, he as the or creator, Los, in other words, imagination. All of this seems co convergent with the scientific movement of complexity theory, which considers all phenomena as emergent from interrelationships of various systems, which human consciousness is only a particle. What an amazing comment. Is there a question in there? But it, uh, that's just amazing. Um, there are, I guess, several questions in there. But you know, what did come to mind while you were reading that was the Joseph Boys kind of stance of everyone is an artist, right? Yeah. And that was the kind of the same idea that, um, I mean, not, not literally did he want everyone to become an artist, but he wanted to see ev everyone to see their creative potential and use that to sculpt life, right? To sculpt the social situation they were in or um, to feel empowered to use their creativity and like, um, be part of creative energy uh, in whatever facet of their life they were in and wherever they were. Um, and I love, I love that idea and actually kind of flip it on my head or flip it on its head and think like everyone's a scientist, right? What would that, what, what is that, what does that mean um, in the 21st century uh, said by Brooke Singer, right? Um, and, and being facetious, but um, I think those, like a lot of the thing I do is trying to move between these different disciplines and merge them and, and um, kind of what, what happens when we blur those boundaries, right? Um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, another kind of tactic is to take something from one discipline um, and put it into the other discipline, right? Um, just like directly. Um, and that that's something that uh, that I've seen done effectively in the arts. Um, but, you know, through this collaboration um, with scientists over the last five years who I uh, have gotten to know very well, we've worked, you know, for a long time and very closely and are close friends by this point. Um, it, it's always uh, such a lovely moment when I see how creative the scientific process is and it is so creative and it's about imagining and you know that the process of hypothesis is um, completely creative and it's then the language and oftentimes what has to be done to be published that turns it into something that seems the least creative thing that we could ever think of um, and uh, one of my collaborators uh, she, um, I was like, you know, it'd be really great to make our own lab coats for this project. And she's like, I have, was sewing, sewing on the streets of Portland and gave workshops making lab coats, you know, like five years ago. And it's like, what? This is very early in our collaboration. I was like, we are meant to work together. So in the garden at the Science Museum for one of the public tours, she brought her sewing machine and was sewing in the garden. And I was answering all the questions about the carbon sequestration and the carbon cycle and, um, you know, uh, the scientific information that wanted to be, um, you know, imparted or whatever. Uh, so I love, I love that, um, 
that kind of back and forth and playfulness. And I shouldn't be surprised anymore, but I always am. Um, and it's because we have so much belief and faith in these uh, disciplines that um, uh, we have to be completely undisciplined. Yes, or different tools. I'm thinking of Buckmaster Fuller's comment, right? I mean, that scientific method is a tool. And yeah. so when you have to come up with something that's provable, repeatable, valid, and reliable, right? It really starts to paint you into a corner in terms yeah. of it's going to meet that. So you're deploying a whole set of different tools, right? In terms of your intuition, your imagination, your sensation, your willingness to put your body in there to participate, to, you know, your, your, all your senses being involved, all new tools. And yeah. so new ways of engaging the same material. But to your point, the idea when you get to collaborate with a scientist or that, you know, your provocation that everybody should be a scientist or think like that is a whole different piece, right? I've got a comment here from someone from Kathy who's pointing out that science is the new mythology, mm. right? That it's a study, it looks like it's saying it's a study of the mysteries now in a new language. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a place for all these tools and I'm not one to, um, uh, I'm not saying to do away with any of them, but I guess what, what you said was quite lovely in terms of um, that uh, the tool um, of scientific inquiry for a certain set of materials, that's not where the certain set of ideas or materials should end, right? And that they can be, and I tried my best to make it, make this happen, moved into different arenas um, so that there is uh, kind of new conversations that happen around it and progress or not progress, but like um, transformation and, and maybe um, some sort of, uh, uh, of um, opportunities that wouldn't have been available in uh, the strict uh, science sense. You could go on and on, I think. I, I, uh, I kept coming back to, I, I think there was a kind of question about um, mythopoetics and uh, science, and is this more science than mythopoetics? And I, I kept coming back to Walt Whitman's A Blade of Grass is the Journey Work of the Stars. Is mm -hmm. that science or is that mythopoetics um it's probably in today's world a blade of grass is the journey work of stars is both science and mythopoetics and uh i think ron shank was very good about pointing out that these divisions between science and artist and what's myth and what's science they they start to break down when you have conversations like this which are just absolutely beautiful I, I well, must. It's also, it's also the perspective of the person looking, right? So, a lot of times I will, you know, offer up my work or apply for something, and it's not, you know, reviewed by an artist panel. It's not art, and it's reviewed by a science panel. It's definitely not science, and that's when I know I'm in the right place when it's denied by both. <laughs> so it's this <laughs> weird thing in between, <laughs> right? Um, so I think uh, the perspective of who's looking and what their expectations are um, matters a great deal. It goes back to um, this whole question of uh, the, um, I'm too old, I can't keep a thought in mind, but uh, I do, the, the Barfield's language about, um, the final stage of uh, participation and that um, if, if in final participation, I guess we are scientists and we're mythologists and we're poets and all of which is trying to reconnect to, to a different relationship to one another and to the natural world. And, and we have to be, maybe Ron was pointing out, we have to be a bit of all of these things. And uh, Anyway, I want to thank both of you for just an extraordinarily uh, stimulating uh, conversation. I, I must say I'm very proud that that uh, that we come from the same stock, Brooke. Uh, 
you just uh, just did a fantastic <laughs> <laughs> and uh i happily uh pass the world on to you and your generation and the generations afterwards i must say what a beautiful job you've both done um i guess i want to just close by uh letting our participant um participants know that there can be an ongoing conversation in the what we call the uh, the new archipelago eris outreach center which is at eris.org and there are forms there and you can continue to ask questions and you can continue to exchange ideas and there's also a gallery associated with gaia then and now and you may want to submit images to that and so we we would hope uh sort of in the spirit of Brooke always wanting to hand tools on and, and, and stimulate conversation, that this is just a beginning of a conversation about Gaia then and now. And, uh, and I think we'll be meeting again in a month and we'll send out news about that. But thank you both so much.